Good day and welcome to the Double Line Total Return webcast. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Ron Riddell, President of Double Line. Please go ahead, sir. Well, thank you and good afternoon and welcome to the Double Line webcast with Jeffrey Gunlock and Andrew Sue. The title of today's webcast, Up, Up and Away. Please mark your calendars uh, for the last webcast of 2022 with uh, Ken Shinoda and our Double Line Income Fund on December 13th, and our most participated webcast uh, to start out the new year, the Just Markets webcast with Jeffrey Gunlock on January 10th. Uh, please join us for that. I'd also like to uh, mention that on December 12th at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 12 Eastern, Jeffrey Gunlock and Felix Zuloff will be hosting a live conversation on the Fed and the markets. We'll be sending an invite out to that after this webcast, and after December 12th, we'll have the replay on our website. If you want to see the rest of the 2023 webcast schedule, you can go to DoubleLine.com. And if you want to receive a copy of today's presentation slides, please go to the webcast player and request webcast content tab. Uh, you can follow us on our Twitter handle, DLINE Funds, and we have a couple of YouTube pages, Double Line Funds and Double Line. We'd like to highlight some of our thought leadership in the media. Also, a very, very widely participated event is Double Line's Roundtable Prime. And that is featuring our the financial thought leaders, Jim Bianco, Daniel DiMartino Booth, Jeffrey Gunlock, Charles Payne this year, and David Rosenberg. And it's moderated by our very own Deputy CIO, Jeffrey Sherman. That's going to be available live on Twitter Spaces on January 4th, and uh, followed by videos on DoubleLine.com. Uh, Ken Shinoda, if you haven't had a chance to tune into DoubleLine's Channel 11, that is on our YouTube page, DoubleLine. And then we have our two, uh, two uh, podcasts, the Sherman Show podcast, widely acclaimed, and then uh, Monday Morning Minutes podcast with uh, Sam Lau and Jeff Mayberry. Those are available at DoubleLine.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Today, uh, uh, Mr. Gunlock and Mr. Sue will be discussing the Double Line Total Return Bond Fund. We have uh, three share classes, the retail, institutional, and retirement share classes. Here you can see, see the different expense ratios and minima, minimums. Lastly, just on standardized performance on the Double Line Total Return Bond Fund, the fund was launched uh, April 6 of 2010 through October of this year. Uh, the annualized return 3.56% versus the Bloomberg US Ag at 1.94%, an annualized outperformance of 1.62%. So without further delay, I'll turn the webcast over to Mr. Jeffrey Gunlock. Thanks, Ron. Thanks everybody for joining us. It's the last webcast of 2022. Seems like the last three years, when we got near the end of the year, everyone was all breathing a sigh of relief. Yay, we're through 2020 and the lockdowns. Yay, we're through 2021. And now I think in the financial world, everyone's yay, we're through 2022 with uh, what was the worst 60-40 performance year at about mid-year uh, of all time, or at least since the 1930s. Um, I'm having a hard time changing, getting the slides to change here. Maybe someone can help me. There we go. Uh, this is called Up, Up and Away. I'm sort of reprising a very important webcast that I did in the summer of uh, 2020 when everything was so uh, uh, haywire. Uh, with government interference and everything going on with the lockdowns. And I actually entitled it Superman, but I used the video up, up and away. And what I was talking about in 2020 was how uh, the bubble economy, thanks to all of the government money printing, had uh, taken over. And I uh, used the video of the fifth dimension up, up and away, uh, which is all these balloons going. But that now coming up with this title, up, up and away has to do with the Fed funds rate which uh, very recently, uh, a year and a quarter ago, was thought to be uh, probably ending 2022 at around 50 basis points, but instead the Fed's raised rates 375 basis points and we're up at about three and seven eighths or 4%, depending upon uh, which viewpoint you use. And the Fed as uh, resolute is their own word that they want to raise interest rates again and they have every intention of getting inflation down. So we're going to be talking here about inflation, the prospects. We're talking, of course, about the recessionary indicators for the economy. And there's a lot of interesting relative value in the bond market. The credit sectors have been extremely volatile with tremendous illiquidity for much of this year, uh, and it's evidenced by the rising interest rates and the returns that we're going to take a look at. Um, in that Superman webcast, where I used the Up, Up, and Away video, I had Jay Powell as Superman because he was carrying the economy 
on his shoulders by uh, basically financing the most outrageous budget deficit in U.S. history uh, in, in response to the pandemic. We see here uh, on oops, slide change. What we see here on the screen is that Superman graphic with Jay Powell's uh, face superimposed. And here are really, there's been really four QEs. In the middle of this exhibit, there's things that twist, which was a very small operation of trying to do a little bit of yield curve control. Let's talk about the ones where they were really buying bonds in bulk. It goes all the way back to uh, uh, 2008 to 2010, where we uh, pretty much crossed the Rubicon on government actions and we did a $201 billion of quantitative easing, bond buying, and everybody thought that, that was a big deal. And then uh, just a short while later, uh, we had QE2. Uh, QE1 ended in March of 2010, and QE2 started in November of 2010. And that went on for uh, about a year um, and a half or so. Yeah, or actually, I'm looking at it now, so about seven months or so, and it was $565 billion. So, more than double QE1 was QE2. And then we had QE3, which was 2012 to 2014, and we did almost triple uh, what we did in QE2 during QE3 from 2012 to 2014. And then we had QE4, which was the Superman situation. And that went on for a couple of years, and it was $4.6 trillion. Now, one of the big questions is what's going to happen next? We have quantitative tightening going on. And uh, will that, together with interest rate increases, which are already very significant by any historical context, what's going to happen? Well, one thing seems fairly uh, clear at this point, we've been talking about this for over a decade now, that the S&P 500, which is that red line, seems to follow the shape of the Fed's balance sheet, obviously not directly, but over um, meaningful time intervals, we see that the stock market took off when the Fed started QE, uh, building its balance sheet, that red line going up in 2009 to 2010, and then they stopped around 2014 and, or, or slowed down, and you see the st uh, stock market went sideways, and then they went full barrel in 2020, and the stock market went up pretty much in line with the balance sheet. And now we see the stock market's rolled over, and uh, that's uh, consistent with the balance sheet shrinking, although it's not shrinking very rapidly and it hasn't shrunk very much. But this is obviously going to be a headwind for things, and we'll talk a lot more about this. Um, this is just an interesting chart. I just threw it in here at this uh, uh, high-level beginning of the uh, presentation uh, at, uh, segment, because what we have here is the budget deficit, and uh, basically it's inverted, so it's percentage of GDP. And when it goes up, it means we have a huge budget deficit. So we saw the response to uh, the lockdowns. But the blue dotted line is what I want to focus into relative to the deficit, because that's the U3 unemployment rate. And in the past, when you've had low unemployment rate, look at that blue line when it's, when it's down at a low level, we see that the deficit is very low historically, that when the deficit expands during recession, not this time. We're starting out in a very precarious position because the unemployment rate is probably starting to rise and we have extremely high budget deficits for the past few years with low unemployment. Just an, an odd combination that might may, mean that historical comparisons uh, may not bear out. One thing that everyone's talking about is the Fed policy rate, which uh, this is the prediction using uh, the, the yield curve of where the uh, Fed funds rate is going to be. So right now we're at about uh, four and we're probably going up to four and a half next week. That's my guessing. I think we're done with the 75s and we're on to the 50s. I think that's appropriate. And certainly the bond market thinks this is going to happen. So we see uh, about a uh, three eighths priced in for December here. And then uh, February looks like another 50 or so. And then peaking out per the market at 5% and only staying there for about uh, one meeting. So you get to 5% and then you repeat it at 5% and then the market thinks it's gonna start falling. And weirdly, uh, the bond market pricing presently is that the Fed funds rate one year from the meeting next week will be basically the same as the Fed funds rate at the meeting next week, which leads me to wonder why we even bother with these hikes, uh, like dig a hole to just to fill it back in. But that's what the market is pricing in. I personally uh, believe that the Fed will not make it to 5%. I think the data is weakening too rapidly. Uh, so um, I suspect that per history, 
I don't have a chart on this, but per history, the Fed, everyone thinks the Fed's going to keep going. And then the, the uh, Fed funds rate ends up uh, not going as high as people think. And we'll talk about the prediction of the two-year Treasury uh, when we get into the bond market section of the presentation. So this is what the market's pricing of where the terminal rate uh, would be uh, in, in the cycle. So you can say at one point, the terminal rate was perceived to be 1%. And then all of a sudden in March of this year, we got this horrible inflation data in the first part of the year, and everybody's expectations really ratcheted higher. And they've now leveled out since around late September, early October, leveled out at around 5%. Again, I don't think we're really going to, to make it to 5%. I know there's a lot of Fed speak saying we need at least five. I think, is it, uh, is it Bullard saying that uh, maybe even 7% fund funds rate? I, I don't think that's going to happen, and we're going to explore that presently. Let's move into the inflation section. Uh, one thing that's clear is inflation is coming down and it's gonna to continue to come down uh, pretty much uh, into the middle of next year, I think. Uh, the CPI peaked at 9.1, uh, it's now at 7.7, .7. it's gonna go lower because there's a, a pretty big number rolling off. We get that number soon. Um, and we kind of predict based on our inflation model at Double Line that by the May CPI print, which is reported in June, it's quite likely that the CPI headline will be year over year below four and a half percent. One thing I've talked about in past webcasts is I really like looking at ex import and export prices because unlike the CPI and the PCE and others, they're really just raw inflation data. There's not all kinds of adjustments There's no, uh, in them. There's no substitutions or hedonics. And we say that we had a really big problem with both import and export prices uh, earlier this year and late last year with uh, export prices were up about 20% almost year over year, and import prices were up in the teens. They have moderated pretty substantially. Uh, now, export prices are, are only, I would say that in kind of air quotes, because in the old days, we thought 6.8 is really high, but uh, we've been through a lot uh, since we had uh, the stable inflation, and there's been a lot of surprises on how high the inflation went. So now, Export prices are 6.8, and import prices are down to 4.2. So it's a very substantial drop, and it seems likely that these prices could continue to moderate. Prices paid, an index by ISM, is really showing a substantial weakness in uh, prices paid manufacturing. It was up at some of the highest readings in history, and it's just plummeting right now, uh, cut in half uh, over the course of, of this year. So uh, very weak uh, manufacturing prices, that is not uh, suggestive of, of more inflation. And of course, uh, CPI has peaked out. I don't have a chart on that here, but uh, CPI uh, tends to be uh, less volatile, but follows the manufacturing prices paid index for, for uh, fairly obvious reasons. What's odd in the market pricing, I think this is the strangest chart I've seen in a long time. It's my favorite chart of, of the moment. And that is the expectations for headline CPI priced into uh, market implied inflation expectations using CPI fixing and also surveys of Bloomberg economists. So what we see here is the expectation is that inflation is going to come down exactly as fast as it went up when it broke out above, say, uh, two and a half, three percent or so. And it's peaked out. And now economists and the CPI fixings have the strangest and I would say most implausible uh, forecast, and that is that inflation is going to come down exactly to about two and a half percent or three percent, and then just stop and go dead sideways out through 2026. So for three years, we're going to have exactly a stable inflation rate. Obviously, if you look at the black line to the left of the dotted blue line, it's obvious inflation is not going to flat line for three years. It's a bizarre forecast. I believe, and this is very important. I believe, and this is a qualifier, I'm not making a statement, I'm making a cause and effect statement, not, not an absolute statement. If the Fed succeeds, and this is the path of inflation, and it comes all the way down to that 3% number um, fairly quickly, I guess that's predicted to be about a year from now. If that happens, I predict it will not stop there. It's possible it doesn't make it down there, but if it has this trajectory, I believe that the inflation rate will go well below, just as it overshot tremendously what the Fed wanted uh, uh, back in 2021. Uh, it'll overshoot, I think, plausibly on the downside. And it wouldn't even surprise me that if, again, this is, a, this is an if statement, if the CPI goes down to near 2% 
at the end of the next year, which has been some of the Fed governor's forecasts, I believe that it will go far below 2% and perhaps negative. What would, what would happen if all of a sudden people were talking about year-over-year -year CPI being zero or negative? I think you would have a massive bond rally. And I sort of think that the bond, bond yields have peaked out. I've talked about this on uh, appearances on CNBC with Scott Wapner before. This is really interesting, though. Let's just compare. This is the forecast. Inflation is going to come down to 2 or 3% quickly. But this is not the first time we've seen this forecast. This is uh, using uh, a Bank of America information. What they have is a survey of professional forecasters on where the inflation rate is projected to be at various points in time. And the red dotted line, stashed lines, those are the predictions. So in June 2021, they thought that inflation was going to be down at 2% by January of 2022. And in January of 2022, they thought it was going to be down to 2% you know, by now. And similarly, in July, you know, now we're saying, well, it's supposed to be going down to 2 or 3%. And so that this forecast has been around for a long time. Uh, I think the forecasts in the past were completely implausible because the Fed wasn't doing any tightening. There was no quantitative tightening going on in July of 2021. The Fed wasn't raising rates in July of 2021. So now we have this accumulation that the Fed acknowledges with long lags that are long and variable uh, that will start the inflation rate. So this time it might come true, but I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm just saying it's that inflation is going to come down. I'm almost positive we'll have a 4% handle headline CPI within about six or seven months from now. Let's look at some other inflation indicators. Here's the commodity index, the Bloomberg Commodity Index. It goes back 20 years on this display, and we had a huge lift off in the commodity prices that ended up accelerating into the first quarter of 2022 with all those CPI numbers that were so bad. And now we're about below the 200-day moving average of the Bloomberg Commodity Index. And we've been living below the 200-day moving average for a few months now. So for those of you that are interested in owning commodities, I mean, it would have been nice to own them from the middle of 2020, which I recommended in the Superman webcast, into the first part of 2022. But now nothing was really happening in commodities. And I think that uh, it makes sense to wait for the market to prove itself. I would want to see the commodity market get some strength going and move above its 200-day moving average, that dotted red line. So far, that's not happening. And uh, oil prices, I didn't check them today, but yesterday they were uh, meaningfully below $80 a barrel for West Texas. A lot of people want to talk about gold. Gold's actually done pretty well this year because uh, it, it, we were looking at it in dollar terms, and the dollar is still up pretty substantially this year, although it's it's a several percentage points off its highs. But gold uh, appears to uh, be stabilizing right around its 200-day moving average. Maybe this is predictive uh, looking forward to a weaker dollar, which I think is now starting to become a real-time prospect. So obviously, the dollar has peaked out, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, but gold uh, may have had a throw throwover where it went below that uh, low in 2021, uh, earlier here in 2022, and now has popped back above that, and it didn't live very long below that uh, horizontal line. So moving above the 200-day moving average, that would be pretty interesting, and we would want to see like a, a weekly close or something like that, not just not just a day. So here's the dollar, and it was going up, 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 and so when you think about gold and dollar terms going broadly sideways, it's going up in a lot of other currencies, because virtually every currency has been down versus the dollar this year. But look at the reversal that we've got here. This is, again, I think sort of suggestive of that curve of the Fed funds rate that we saw that says it's going to peak out in about six months at 5%. Um, that would mean that the Fed will be uh, re relatively dovish versus perhaps other central banks if that curve ends up playing out. And maybe the dollar traders are anticipating that. But with this, with this dollar reversal, we've seen uh, some improvement in risk assets and we've seen some improvement in the stock market, the S&P uh, hovering now around uh, 3,900 or 4,000 when it was down around 3,550 uh, just a few months ago. Now, here's something that's very uh, little talked about, but very significant. And uh, in our roundtable prime, I'm sure uh, Dave Rosenberg will be talking about this because he's a, a very astute monetarist economist. But M2 growth is basically the lowest if, in my lifetime which is saying a lot. Uh, this goes back to the day I was, to the year I was born, 1959. And we see that the M2 growth is negative. This is six months annualized. 
we're darn near zero on the 12 month number, but we're, we like using the six month annualized to pick up a little bit more high frequency trends. And it's pretty obvious that M2 growth is extremely sluggish. That's not very supportive of the economy, and it's certainly not a supportive of a, a, an accelerating inflation narrative. Now, one thing that's really changed since the Superman webcast with the up, up, and away video is the savings rate. The government gave everybody tons of money, and we see the spike in the savings rate, uh, and now it's down to a very low rate. So this is basically comparing savings to disposable personal income. This is not accumulation of the savings pool. It's sort of a monthly number. But the savings rate has collapsed, and there is no saving going on by historical standards right now. And that, of course, is suggestive of a weak consumer. It is not a positive when people borrow money to buy things. I have to laugh when I see consumer credit data uh, every month, and there's a cheer that goes up when people borrow a lot of money to buy things because the, 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 the rap is that that's suggestive of a confident consumer. Well, maybe, but I think it's, cons it's suggestive of a desperate consumer and a consumer that is borrowing money to buy food and gas. And there's anecdotal evidence that we've talked about in the past with like Walmart customers using credit cards to buy food and many new time customers at Walmart buying food that used to shop at Whole Foods. This is one way that they can't combat the inflation rate. Here's the monthly change in excess savings. So of course we saw those spikes in 2020 and 2021 with the government giveaway programs, but we've had many months in a row now of accelerating declines in excess savings. So it's not only declining, it's declining at an ever growing rate. And this decline, except for the bumps from government giveaway programs in 2021, the decline has been relentless going back two years and nearly a half now. So this is, this is not economically positive. And of course, here's revolving credit. So essentially this is you know credit card use and stuff. I and mean, it, it disappeared back in 2020. Some people paid down their credit cards with government money. But now it's been accelerating for two years, and uh, it's at a relatively high level by any historical standard going back to the year 2000 in this exhibit. So these are all uh, suggestive of recession coming. Uh, leading indicators are very suggestive of recession. The red shaded bars, as, as always in these webcasts, are recessionary periods that are officially declared. And you'll notice that when you get the uh, leading indicators, the annual rate now is negative 2.7. The six months annualized is now negative 6.3. Um, these are uh, really in recessionary territory. You'll notice that the recessions of uh, 08 had a very similar look. The recession prior to the pandemic, very similar look. So this is full on uh, re recession watch. Here's sentiment indicators, and we've got a lot of them on here. Uh, here we have the gray areas, our recessions. But we see consumer confidence clearly declining. Look at the black dotted line. That's the average of all of these measures, consumer confidence, CEO confidence, home builder confidence, small business optimism. And it's weak. Well, let's face it. It looks a lot like how it looks going into the global financial crisis. I guess one positive is we've had a small bump recently in consumer confidence and in a small business optimism. But uh, still, this indicator is not a suggestive of an accelerant from sentiment in the economy. I didn't include the slide this time, I'll go back. Uh, we like to compare the consumer sentiment of the present compared to the future. So it's when you take a look at the future minus the present and the, the a view of the future is always relatively caution, uh, a little bit pe pessimistic. And the view of the present can move around with more volatility. When you get a very big gap between the view of the present being way worse than the view of, of the present, that puts you on preliminary recession watch. But when that gap starts to fall, which has happened recently, with the view of the present starting to join the view of the future in pessimism, that's when you're really getting close to the front edge of a recession. And that has happened um, in a way that's getting pretty convincing. The most recent month really showed uh, that dynamic. Here's the yield curve, very much talked about. This is the 10-year minus the three-month bill. Um, it's really recessionary. It's at the same type of inversion that we've had for all the recessions over the past 30 years uh, pr prior to, to Volcker. We've got, there's a lot of ways to look at the yield curve. Here's one that uh, Jay Powell likes to talk about, comparing the three-month bill now to the 
of the forward of where the three-month bill might be 18 months from now. And that's also in the red. That's the shaded area. The blue line is the Fed funds rate. And you'll notice that when uh, this thing goes inverted, you're pretty close to the end historically of interest rate increases. Now, maybe this time's different because we have a higher inflation problem that we have to combat, but uh, these indicators have been reliable over the years. There's some that we've used, we used to use uh, prior to the pandemic. I'm revisiting a couple of them now. The blue uh, shaded area are the, the middle uh, quartiles of recession uh, lead up, and the black vertical line is, the, uh, is at zero because that's the, the beginning of the recession. So what we have here is a black line, which is right in the middle of that blue range, and that basically averages all these past recessions as to how the twos tens yield relationship looked going into the recession. And we've mapped somewhat arbitrarily the red line, which is our current experience. Um, they're raising rates so quickly that the slope is very different from the past. So we've put it arbitrarily uh, as a best fit that we're maybe six months away from a recession using the twos tens yield curve. But if you look at the depth of the uh, inversion, twos, tens, that's at this same type of level, maybe we're only, I don't know, uh, uh, this is weeks away, maybe we're only 12 weeks away or three months. So we're really starting to look at recession, not, not years away, but quarters away, perhaps several months away. And then here's the ISM PMI leading into recessions, the same sort of exercise. And uh, this one's declining about in line with the historical average, now a little bit uh, faster. Uh, if we go from the, you know, the uh, 24 uh, months uh, before the recession to now, but this suggests the recession is maybe two months away using the ISM. So we're really gonna be interested in this ISM data as it's been coming out. Um, there was a surprise recently with uh, services data looking stronger, but, uh, Yes, so uh, we'll be watching that carefully. So here's ISM manufacturing supplier delivery days. This is another reason why the economy is su suggestive of weakness. Remember all the supply chain bottlenecks and everyone blamed uh, inflation a lot on supply chains and the like. Well, the ISM manufacturing supplier delivery delays has disappeared. I mean, we're, we're basically at one of the lower levels uh, of the past 40 years on this metric. So that probably means that there's less demand. There's less delay probably because there's less demand. Perhaps there's been some um, unlocking of supply chain problems, but this clearly is not an inflationary indicator. And here's one that really matters. Uh, what, what, the, what the economic bulls wanna talk about is how low the unemployment rate is and how it's been stable at this low level. One thing we uh, know is that employment data is lagging. It's really the last thing to give up the ghost. So what we like to do is to plot the unemployment rate uh, versus its 12 month moving average, which is the red dotted line. And again, the red bars are recessionary periods. And you'll notice that in the last uh, three recessions, including the pandemic one, but the two uh, big ones before that, it's right at the front edge of the recession that the unemployment rate crosses above its 12 month moving average. And the 12 month moving average keeps falling. So we're gonna be watching if the unemployment rate crosses above its 12 month moving average, I think that will be uh, when they declare that the recession is beginning. Now, what is the prediction by economists? Well, here it is. This is a consensus opinion on where the unemployment rate is going uh, in, the, in the next uh, nine or 10 months or so. And that's the yellow line. And it's obviously predicted to go higher and predicted to go well into the fours. So when we, if, if this ends up being the case, it's quite obvious that the black line will cross over the dotted red line, and that will be game over. Uh, if that crosses over in any significant way, then we're in a recession. And I expect that's gonna happen uh, by the middle of next year using these indicators. So here's some more labor indicators. This is from my friend, uh, Manak, Manak Associates. Uh, and we see here that the, we've have inflection now in the US labor market indicators. Jobs hard to fill is still high, but jobs plenty easy to get is coming down. Uh, and it, when it hooks over, look at the past, at those gray shaded areas of recession, when it hooks over this amount, it's historically been recessionary. So a lot going on in these charts. So we've got a lot of charts today, but there's a lot of important information uh, in this webcast, uh, in my view. How, now let's go to housing. Housing, of course, is not gonna be an accelerant for the economy, far from it. We can see housing affordability has gone from very good, 
pre-pandemic and, and during the free money from the government. And now it's at the lowest level in 30 years. So affordability for housing is there. Obviously, it's because housing prices are up 40%, maybe even more in some places, and interest rates, of course, are up. When you look at that, if, you've, if you're buying a house today and you have to take out a mortgage, a classic mortgage, 80%, uh, you know, 20% down, and it's a 30 year uh, type of mortgage, and you have to apply that to the median priced home in America, the monthly payment has gone from, monthly payment has gone from about uh, 17% of disposable income uh, pre-pandemic to now something like 33% of disposable income. So affordability has fallen dramatically. Uh, this is the uh, top panel here is the 30 year mortgage rate. So the 30 year mortgage rate is now in the high sixes, even went above seven, down from in the twos uh, just a couple of years ago and even, even uh, one year ago, what year and a half ago. And now at the bottom, this is actually the rate that it, on average homeowners that have mortgages, they're not looking to buy a house, they already own their house, this is what they're paying. So this is essentially the weighted gross coupon in the agency mortgage market, roughly. And you can see that it's a 3.25. So there's gonna be a lot of people not wanting to move because if you move, uh, you're probably gonna have to take out a much more expensive mortgage. So people's, a lot of homeowners, their best asset in 2022 is actually their liability in a sense, it's their mortgage because their mortgage uh, is at such a favorable rate versus where a new mortgage would have to come. That's going to slow down the housing market. Oh, so it already is, obviously. Here's the mortgage purchase index from Mortgage Bankers Association, one of the lowest levels uh, in 20 years. Did tick up a little bit uh, recently, but uh, still very low. And here's the supply of new homes in months, uh, months of the selling rate. And so we've done an amazing round trip here. Just uh, a year and a half, two years ago, we had the lowest supply of new homes in history of this series uh, going back to 1960s. And now it's one of the uh, more robust inventories up uh, at about nine months. And that usually, you'll notice that that usually coincides weirdly with uh, recessions because apparently, you know, when there's less demand, and homes are sitting on the market, that's not suggestive of, of economic strength. So not surprisingly, nobody's refinancing their mortgages. Uh, the average coupon is 3.7, people have to take out the high sixes, no one's gonna do that. So the refinancing index has never before been literally at zero. There is basically zero refinancing. Um, a few weeks ago, I haven't checked it uh, so recently, um, there are 92% of the agency guaranteed mortgage backed securities market, 92% of the mortgages would not be economically refinanceable even if mortgage rates went down 200 basis points. 200 basis points, 92% of mortgages would still not be refinanceable because of you know, how a long rate stayed low and how quickly they rose. So it's pr pretty incredible. This leads to an extraordinarily interesting uh, mortgage market, which we'll get to um, uh, I'll just I'll tease the one thing about it. Mortgage market usually has a problem, and that is it's lived most of its life at an aggregate price of around 100. And when you have callable securities, refinanceable securities that are sold at 100, you have a very bad profile of upside versus downside. The upside is limited because if they go up meaningfully with lower interest rates in price, they'll just get refinanced at 100 into new mortgages. And of course, if interest rates rise, they go down a lot, which we've seen this year. But mortgages have gone down so much, and they're so far so-called out of the money relative to refinancing, that we had the strangest occurrence. We actually had positive convexity, more upside than downside in the mortgage market as of about a month ago. Now it's neutral. But versus history, the mortgage market, in terms of risk reward, is as favorable as at any time in at least 25 years. And the, and the yield spreads, as we'll see in a, in, a, in a few more charts, are highly attractive. The combination of positive upside versus downside or neutral upside versus downside and historically very ample excess yield versus treasury makes this sector very attractive. Now, let's talk about uh, interest rates and interest rate trends. Here's the two-year treasury. 
Amazingly, it actually went up faster and obviously much farther than it went down in response to the economic weakness and the lockdown. So the two-year Treasury soared up to about four and a half percent or so. Now it's at about 4.3, but a huge increase, and it looks to be it looks to be uh, stalling out for the first time in several months. Here's uh, what I say. I've used this chart before. I'm not being facetious. We should replace the the Fed with the two-year U.S. Treasury yield. The Fed funds rate is the red line. The blue line is the two-year U.S. Treasury. And you'll notice that uh, in the recession back in the late 90s, early 00s, the Fed funds rate uh, stopped going up. The two-year got higher. That's where we are right now uh, in the recession of the global financial crisis. Basically, uh, the two-year hit its peak, and the Fed funds rate got there almost at exactly the same time. The two-year started to fall, and it was just several months before the Fed started to cut. On average, when the Fed uh, does its last rate hike, and they might not be aware that it's their last rate hike, but in a tightening cycle, they usually start easing within about five months uh, afterwards. So the two-year Treasury uh, appears to possibly maybe has peaked out. Uh, with the Fed still being uh, resolute, we could still get another up leg in the two-year. But uh, right now, it doesn't look like we have a lot of upward pressure on long-term interest rates, which we'll see now. Here's the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, and it's down. I mean, amidst all of this Fed uh, hawkishness, Bullard saying we might have to go to 7%, and all of this uh, talk about we're going to get the job done, what's happening is 10-year Treasury yields have started to fall. And I talked about this in uh, the last webcast and, and publicly, that I think rates are peaking out here in the fourth quarter of uh, 2022. We've already had a 75 basis point decline in the 10-year Treasury just over the past few weeks. And as the Fed keeps talking tough, the tenure is starting to taunt them by going lower. This is sort of classic late cycle action. And look at the slope of that tenure going up. You'll notice that from the, from the low point in 2020, it kind of forms a parabola if you draw a stylized arc through it. And it looks like that parabola might be in uh, danger of being breached, which would signal potentially a top in interest rates. Let's take a look at the copper gold ratio, our old friend. We're using a five-year uh, analysis window. We always also use 10-year analysis windows. Both show similar results, although not, not identical. They both say the 10-year Treasury yield is too high. Just looking at the five-year time window here, uh, the red line is the 10-year Treasury yield, and the blue line is the ratio of the price of copper to the price of gold. And you'll notice that they were very uh, similar during 2018 and 2019 into the pandemic. And then we had all of this suppression of things by the government and uh, the copper gold ratio exploded saying rates are too low, rates are too low, the 10 years too low, particularly about a year and a half ago, where the blue line was way up there and the, we were so low still on 10 year treasury yields at 1%. But look how they converged. They converged with copper gently declining, copper gold ratio gently declining and 10 year treasury yields soaring. Well, the copper gold ratio was right and maybe it's right again that uh, the ten this time window says the 10-year Treasury yield should be about 100 basis points lower than it is today. So, so bonds are much more attractive, obviously, than they were a year ago, uh, where 10-year Treasury yield was so low, down at 1%. Uh, so things have gotten a lot cheaper. And one thing about bonds I've learned in over 40 years of this is the starting point really matters. Just like a mortgage market priced at 100 has bad risk reward when you get bonds down into the 80s, 70s, 60s, which are prices that are found in parts of the low investment grade to a higher tier junk bond markets. These, are, these bonds have every ability to go back towards 100. Even if you factor in defaults, when you're down at 50, 60 cents on the dollar, you probably uh, really don't have that much default risk. Even if they all default, you'll probably get about your purchase price. Where you start really matters. And Andrew will talk about the current price of uh, the market and the uh, total return bond fund, which is highly attractive entry point. Just for completion, here's the 30-year Treasury yield. We've got a long-term, very well-defined trend line, which has had been broken. Um, so we turned 30-year Treasury, had a big increase in yield as well. That has also reversed in recent weeks. But look at the drawdown on the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond. Um, by far the highest in history, we actually had a 50% drawdown. That means high price to low price uh, during, a, during a move. 
uh, the worst drawdown clearly by a mile, uh, going all the way back, uh, you know, 40, 40 years or so uh, on this exhibit. Um, where, real yields certainly went up a lot. Real yields going up, and this that was the story of the first part of 2022, is very bad for risk assets. So not surprisingly, stocks uh, have a bear market going on. We've seen very substantial yield increases in lower tiers of, of risk. Um, the good news is that the real yields have stopped going up based on the comparison of nominals to tips, and they're now basically back to where they were in 2019. So not surprisingly, we've seen rallies in credit. We've seen rallies of, of you know, not insignificant rallies in the S&P 500, and, and particularly in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So here's a proof statement that real yields going up is bad for, for uh, stocks. The P-E ratio uh, is the blue line, and then the real yields, 10-year uh, real yield is inverted here. Uh, so we can see the stock markets man managed to rally thanks to real yields falling, as we saw in the other exhibit. And there's an obvious tie-in because you know the PE is, has to be discounted relative to uh, real yields. So here's the S&P 500, nice rally. Um, came up on the S&P to the 200-day moving average. Uh, it's starting to run out of steam, uh, and we'll see what happens uh, as we enter 2023. I expect that with all the tax loss selling, that has gone on, uh, understandably, with this being a very bad year for stocks and bonds, I think there might, might be redeployment of capital that starts 2023. I, I would not be surprised if we saw strength in riskier assets, uh, at least temporarily, in the first couple of months of 2023. But we're not starting at the same hyper-attractive level uh, that we were uh, back at that low at about 35.50 on S&P 500. I just want to include a couple of charts, which are kind of fascinating and how they seem to uh, give us uh, signposts for the direction of the S&P 500. We've got here is liquidity, which is defined by the Fed balance sheet and some other uh, measures, including reverse repo, to, to get to a measure that Morgan Stanley does of, of liquidity uh, in the system. And then we've got the S&P return on here. And we can see that the blue line and the yellow line certainly seem to, to match up. So liquidity matters a lot in markets. Unfortunately, liquidity has been declining and with quantitative tightening should, should uh, uh, have a headwind uh, with that. Also, S&P tracks the bond volatility index, the move index. It's kind of interesting how the uh, perceived uh, volatility of treasuries uh, seems to have a very close correlation to the uh, return the, the, the return on the S&P 500. It's interesting. Here's uh, the things we talked about in the Superman webcast have come true. One of the main themes of that webcast in the summer of 2020 was all of these uh, me mega trends from the late OOs, the global, global, pre global financial crisis, into the lockdowns. They were massive trends. And I said, I think they're over. And one of them was growth versus value. And it's quite obvious that growth is underperforming value over the past two years, and not by a small amount. Uh, that trend uh, appears to be underway still. The NASDAQ uh, clearly uh, peaked out in 2020 relative to the S&P 500. It is not an insignificant underperformance now of about 20 percentage points. I think there's more room to go on that. Here's uh, just the very narrow part of the NASDAQ. These are the Manama stocks. Now that it's not Facebook anymore, we've gone away from FANG into Manama. I don't know if, if that's the way people pronounce it, but uh, that's what we have on the screen here. And that's, uh, this is from Manac Associates again. I want to give credit where credit's due. What we have here is uh, just a few stocks uh, that were really setting the world on fire. And then we have the S&P without those six stocks, the 494. And you'll notice the S&P hasn't done anything in two years except for these six stocks. And of course, these six stocks are six sick stocks at this point, because uh, it looks like there's a ways to go, quite frankly, I think that you're probably going to go all the way back down to the launch point, which so often happens when you have a blow off, which could be as low as 600 uh, on this index. So it could be another uh, underperformance period going. And you'll notice that uh, the MSCI X United States has done absolutely nothing since 2020. In fact, really almost nothing since 2018. So these trends have all reversed, except this one, 
equity prices versus the rest of the world. It's too early to call this a reversal. You need a magnifying glass to see it. But this has been going on for a very long time, since basically pre-global financial crisis, the U.S. has outperformed the rest of the world by something like 300 percentage points. And that's had a lot to do with the currency. And the dollar has topped. And the dollar may well decline significantly uh, if the Fed starts easing up with a recession. Uh, versus the rest of the world. And that would be the catalyst for the rest of the world to start out performing. Here we see Europe uh, has basically matched, if you, if, you don't, if you hedge out the currency, Europe has basically matched the S&P 500 over the past two years since the Superman webcast. It hasn't done it by much, but it's been holding its own, certainly. What's not holding its own are emerging markets, uh, which I thought I had a slide in here. I may have been remiss to put it in, but emerging markets, uh, have started to perform, particularly as the dollar has crested in recent weeks. Let's look at the bloodless verdict of the market. This is all kinds of asset classes, equities all down. You'll see the S&P, uh, this was through, uh, I think November 30th, I'm not sure it's been updated, but we can see that everything's down in fixed income and equities. Uh, the only thing that's not down a lot is bank loans, which we talked about the Just Markets webcast in, in, Ju in, in uh, January. It was my top selection for fixed income uh, were bank loans, and they've at least preserved capital. And then we see commodities are a mixed bag with uh, copper now down. Uh, that's one of the reasons the copper gold ratio is low. Well, we see uh, gold is down a little, but copper's down more. What's basically up is the energy complex. If we sort credit by its performance year to date, we see that only double B bank loans have a positive return. Uh, CLOs, AAA, those are floating rate too. And then leverage loans broadly are down 1%. And then you kind of go sliding down the hill. And we see that as you get into credit, we see triple C high yield off three from the right, down 15%. We see investment grade. Interestingly, the lowest slice is high yield, triple C. That's, that's the lowest credit slice. It's down 15 and change. The highest corporate credit slice is triple A. It's down even more. So lots of negative 15s on here, lots of, of, of pain in the bond market, but the, uh, it's, it's very different when you start out at these price levels and when you have the Fed already doing so much of their work. Here's the S&P, I, I, I did put it in, versus emerging markets. And it looks like we've got a throw over. So we had a massive outperformance uh, S&P versus emerging by four and a half X from uh, 2011 into uh, earlier this year, and now we have a throw over. We're, we're now below the peaks of both uh, the OO recession and, and the, uh, and the uh, dot com bust. And uh, it's interesting, a lot of people say emerging markets can't outperform when you're uh, in recessions, but they actually can uh, from times depending upon the direction of the dollar. So emerging markets look pretty good uh, in equities on a valuation basis. They're about half the uh, half the CAPE ratio of the S&P 500 still, and it looks like maybe the dollar trend has reversed. So here's um, the spread on emerging markets bonds uh, versus the dollar. And so here we have the, uh, the dollar in blue, and that's on the left-hand scale. And then we have emerging markets spreads versus US treasuries. And not surprisingly, they track each other pretty closely. So now that the dollar has peaked out, we see that emerging market spreads have come in pretty meaningfully by something like 125 basis points, really almost 150 from their wides of, that sum, of the summer. They're still pretty wide, but they're not as cheap as they were a couple of months ago. A couple of months ago, uh, around the Fed meeting in September, we talked about how bonds were wickedly cheap to stocks. And uh, that's a very big change for where they started the year with stocks overvalued by any historical measure, like PE ratios and CAPE ratios and price to book, but actually cheap to bonds. Stocks were cheap to bonds entering uh, 2022, and I talked about that in the webcast in January, but not anymore. Uh, as of September, bonds were screamingly cheap versus stocks. They're still cheap to stocks because the yields that you can get per unit of risk are so much higher now than the dividend yield or the, the earnings yield, if you will, on the S&P 500. So here's how spreads have, have moved around um, going back uh, three decades in a little bit. 
we see on the left-hand panel, we have uh, investment grade spreads and scale is uh, basically zero to 600 basis points. And we see we have quite a bit of widening, uh, much of which, or a third of which has been reversed in the last few weeks. And we're gonna see in a few slides how corporate credit appears to be rich versus other forms of credit, thanks to this spread tightening, which has been particularly strong uh, in, the, in the corporate credit market. On the right-hand panel, we see high yield. The spread started out uh, this cycle down at about 300 basis points and made it out, uh, forget about the, the, the lockdown blip there, just look at this year, made it out to about 600, not quite, maybe 575, and have reversed again about a third of that. So one thing that's sort of amazing is what happened just in the last couple of weeks. Investment grade spreads have been decompressing uh, for most of most of this year, and high yield spreads have been very decompressing. The gray line at the top of the high yield panel there is the spread on uh, triple C's, and they went from a level of about 600 basis points to double that at 1,200. But fascinatingly, I put the slide together a couple of weeks ago, and I had to I wanted to update it for this uh, webcast. And that huge step function down in that triple C gray line happened in just the past couple of weeks, and that's a 200 basis point tightening. So there's been a very large move on some of these corporate names. The junk bond market had sort of uh, very notable inflows. I think there were about five weeks where something like 13 billion came in uh, because of the way in which people are starting to uh, reassess relative value. I think clearly a mix of credit assets two months ago was very undervalued versus the equity market. So here is uh, three-year ret rolling returns. I'm just putting this on here uh, just to point out how bad the declines have been in 2022. Uh, if uh, we, We've included the March 2020 period where we, which we just went into a mine shaft decline for all credit. Uh, but amazingly, this declines uh, on the red line, which is a uh, total return of, of US corporate investment grade, it's worse than it was in the drop-off in March of 2020. And we see that the blue line, uh, the high yield return, I mean, that decline's been about the same uh, in terms of magnitude, but it's been much more sustained and uh, appears like perhaps uh, these, these are bottoming out. Uh, one thing to worry about uh, in this economy is uh, defaults. So what we have here is an interesting chart. This is from Deutsche Bank. And what we have is the blue, light, light blue line is the US high yield default rate on the right hand scale. And then the black uh, bars, that's the C and I loan standards. And when the bars are big, it means they're tightening a lot. And you'll see that when the blue, and this is uh, leading by three quarters. So we have the last three quarters of lending uh, standards have tightened a lot. We see the Dark blue bars are up at around eight or nine percent uh, uh, on the right hand on the uh, it's on the left hand scale. So it's up at around twenty percent or so on the left hand scale. And there's a very good fit between default rates nine months forward and these lending standards tightening. So we'll see. I mean, it's uh, a lot of high yield borrowers got very very favorable rates with the Fed uh, keeping rates so low for so long and the 10 year treasury at around 1% for a very long period of time led to a lot of potential refinancing. So to the extent that the financing's locked up at those low rates, maybe it's okay. Where you could have problems now is in bank loans. My favorite fixed income asset class for 2022 is no longer my favorite uh, fixed income asset class, not even close because A, the Fed might loosen and that would lead to a lower coupon, but you could have defaults there. I mean, these companies, have floating rate debt. Bank loads are floating rates. So it's great as an investor when the rate goes up, but what if that starts to pinch the economic viability when you're paying not 3%, but paying 7% on the same debt? Um, that could be an issue. So watch out uh, for, for that. I'm getting much less positive than where I was a year ago on bank loans. Let's look at a relative value comparison. I'm almost finished here. I know I'm going a little long, but I think it's a lot of very good information Sometimes there's almost nothing to talk about. Today, I think I could go for four hours. But here's CMBS AAAs, AAAs, the absolute highest credit quality, non-agency guaranteed CMBS versus corporate investment grade broadly, which is sort of a single A slash triple B rating 
And we have a very unusual uh, setup right now where for five years, you always had a lower spread on the, on the CMBS AAAs, but not anymore. You actually have more yield spread on AAA CMBS, and not, not and noticeably so, than where you typically were on average, which uh, the average is about give 30 basis points, it's now pick up 19. So you're about 50 basis points cheap on CMBS AAAs, which translates to about four or five points of likely outperformance should this relationship normalize. So we really like um, securitized assets, mortgages broadly, CMBS. Uh, you've got to have a very robust analytic process and default screening process and uh, bottom-up management. Of course, we have that at Double Line. Uh, we're very comfortable with our CMBS holdings. Here we have another thing. This is uh, CLOs. So this is resecuritized. Uh, bank loans. These are ones that are turned into CLOs in a triple B category, which of course is the highest rating tier of high yield. And we're comparing the yield on triple B, CL, double B rather, CLOs to the entire high yield market. So it's like a single B. So we're comparing a double B CLO to a single B uh, high yield. And again, we have a very expanded relationship. Back in 2018, there, the spreads were quite similar. Not anymore. The, the spreads on the triple B CLO are cheaper by a lot. I mean, there are 900 and 973 basis points versus 438. So it's over 500 basis points of, of, a, of a differential. This is, I mean, to, to use sort of a slang term, this is like ginormic in terms of, of relative attractiveness. So Here's the yield to worst presently. This takes us back to uh, Friday, I think, on various sectors of the fixed income market. You notice there's no ones or twos or threes anymore. That's all you saw 15 months ago. 15 months ago, to get 5% out of fixed income, to leverage a junk bond portfolio 50% and hope you have no defaults. This is after some of the significant spread tightening that we were witnessing in some of the previous slides on corporate bonds and on uh, emerging markets and on, and on high yield, but still you have double Bs uh, you know, at 6.8, you've got the high yield market at 8.8 .8 to no defaults. You got triple Bs uh, at 10.9 uh, in parts of the market. So lots of yield out there. And so if you put together a portfolio, and this is done by Morgan Stanley, you put together a portfolio of you know, investment grade bonds, some emerging markets, some tips, um, high dividend stocks, and you kind of throw them together. I don't know exactly what the, their, their weightings are, but they have a consistent methodology. And basically, you've gone from a yield of two on one of these uh, yield portfolios to a yield of about six. And as we saw in the previous slide, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of reason to believe you could get high single digits or even low double digits. Uh, you're going to have to be aggressive in fixed income to get those double digit yields. But it's quite possible that if markets stabilize and the Fed uh, has to deal with weakening inflation as a consequence of their actions and perhaps recession coming in prospect, we could see uh, very strong returns out of the bond market in 2023. So with that, uh, Andrew, I'm sorry I went a little long, but I thought it was warranted. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. And he's going to go through some of the facts of the total return bond fund. And as usual, if, if time permits, I'll probably try to, try to take a couple of questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up uh, after that. So, Andrew, please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. Um, let's begin by looking at portfolio statistics. Uh, there are a couple notable figures here uh, to point out. Firstly, we have been extending the interest rate duration of the fund. Uh, the portfolio is positioned right about six years now. And then when you compare this to the duration of the index, uh, we are still shorter, but this is the closest margin that we've had uh, versus the index since the fund's inception. Uh, another notable figure to highlight here is the average price. Uh, the portfolio does have an approximate one point price advantage versus that of the index. And this is something that Jeffrey was uh, referring to in terms of entry point. Uh, you'll have to remember that the fund is comprised 100% in securitized uh, investments, um, and these do receive regular principal and interest payments. So as paydowns do come in, they do a creep towards par. So the larger the discount, uh, the more positive optionality the portfolio has. Uh, finally, 
Looking a little bit more closely at duration, uh, here we're looking at historical duration of the fund, and that's depicted by the blue line, and we're comparing it to the red line, which is the 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, we have been active in duration management over time, and if you look at the far right side of the chart, you can see that uh, we have extended duration as rates were rising, uh, and, and we did position the portfolio well to catch this latest rate rally. Uh, we've instituted a similar extension program during the first quarter of 2021, but there, uh, there are some slight differences how we expressed our views, uh, especially compared most recently uh, to, to the current phenomenon. Now, in 2021, we extended using exclusively treasury securities, but uh, due to how attractive mortgage-backed securities currently are, uh, this round of extension has included both mortgage-backed and treasury securities. Uh, in terms of portfolio composition, uh, we have favored government guaranteed asset with the extension program utilizing more treasuries. Over 55% of the assets now are in uh, agency mortgage back and CMBS or commercial mortgage back assets, uh, treasuries or cash. Uh, the balance of the portfolio is in secured credit assets. Uh, these are the asset backed uh, CLOs or collateralized loan obligations, non-agency commercial and residential mortgage securities. Uh, I'll, I'll note that the vast majority of the credit assets in the portfolio, they are in the senior most positions as well. So very well protected in the event uh, of a recession here. Looking at some of the fundamental drivers for the portfolio here, we see the uh, two year change in the Schiller home price index. Uh, we did peak out at a staggering plus 40% in uh, 2021. That's essentially 40% uh, growth over two years. And with rising interest rates more recently this year, uh, there has been pressure on home prices. Um, despite this, the two-year change in home prices uh, still remains at a lofty 32%. So very, very lofty levels still uh, we're looking at. We do expect home prices to fall, though. And there are a number of variables supporting this thesis. Um, and it does include home, uh, excuse me, home inventories uh, in the pipeline. Those are definitely increasing, and you do see a, a big backlog there. And then on the rent side, we haven't quite seen... Uh, rents fall significantly yet, but certainly they have plateaued. So watching that quite closely as well. But uh, uh, both of those variables uh, certainly will have an impact on home prices. We receive many questions, uh, you know, often on uh, from our investors about the correction in home prices and then the subsequent ramifications to the borrowers. Uh, here we see mortgage delinquencies, and they continue to remain at all-time lows despite falling home prices. Uh, we, we don't subscribe to the idea that the home price correction today will resemble that of 2008. Uh, the home owner base is significantly uh, higher quality in 2022. They do have more savings and also less leverage at the household level. So very different picture at the borrower level. Uh, so they should be able to impact uh, some correction in, in home prices that we are starting to see right now. Looking at the commercial real estate market, there has been a lot of news in this space, and we have two charts here uh, depicting some of the fundamentals within the sector. Uh, the left-hand side, the bar chart here, depicts the RCA National Price Index, and uh, this index tracks commercial real estate prices based on transactions within the market. And what you'll notice here is that you do see falling prices uh, you know, within this index, but it's important to note that the transaction volume within the commercial real estate market has been very limited this year. Um, it's really been concentrated in marquee assets within the strongest sectors. We do think if transaction volumes were to expand and start to include some of the more challenged subsectors, such as office or retail, it's very likely you'd see further decreases in home, uh, excuse me, commercial prices uh, within this index. Uh, moving to the right, looking at the right-hand chart, fundamentally, CRE assets, they continue to recover. Um, within the strongest sectors. So industrial, lodging, multifamily, seeing delinquencies fall to pre-COVID levels, but then other areas such as retail and office still reasonably elevated. Uh, if you look at that blue um, line going across the middle of the data, data set, that is the retail uh, subsector of uh, commercial real estate. And you do see that delinquencies have essentially plateaued there, uh, roughly six or 7%, not really uh, improving. And that is... Um, giving us some indication that the economy certainly is weakening um, within that area. Let's see. This next slide uh, is really looking at uh, consumers. Uh, consumers account for approximately 70% of US GDP. So clearly the health of the consumer is very important to the forward expectations of the economy here in the United States. 
Um, here we're looking at serious delinquencies, and that's 90 days or more delinquent across various consumer sectors. Uh, levels, they remain relatively low across uh, most of these data sets, but you'll notice that credit cards, which is the purple line, and then uh, auto loans, which is the blue line, they are seeing a visible up, uh, upward trend. Uh, so clearly some delinquencies picking up in that area. Uh, one interesting thing to note from our side is that we do break out all the cohorts and uh, looking at the middle income cohort across all consumer uh, delinquencies, that is actually increasing in delinquency at the fastest pace. So that's something to keep an eye on, certainly the largest cohort within the U.S. economy. And uh, if those borrowers are facing headwinds in terms of being able to make their payments on different uh, types of consumer loans, uh, that could certainly become a problem. And now we're talking about mortgages. We don't see much change in mortgages. Uh, we talked about that, so I won't um, spend too much time there. But student loans, uh, student loans are really seeing no activity there. Uh, there was supposed to be the end of the moratorium in December of this year, but the Biden administration has extended the uh, payment moratorium on student loans until June of 2023. Um, I didn't think that there would be an extension past December, so you really can't rule out further extensions past June. But uh, until those moratoriums are lifted, you're really not going to see much action there. Uh, really flat and very low delinquencies there. But again, a lot of the federally funded student loans um, not really even required to make a payment. Last slide for me before I hand this back to Jeffrey. Uh, this slide will focus on the credit portion of the fund. And here we're looking at the average credit enhancement of our positions versus serious delinquencies. And this is broken out by subsectors. Uh, as a refresher credit enhancement, what it refers to is the ability of a bond to absorb defaults before we see even a dollar of principal loss. So as you can see across all of these sectors, uh, we are very well protected against uh, even severe default scenarios. Uh, on the left, legacy non-agency RMBS, uh, that looks like the margin's quite thin there, but I would remind you that uh, you need, do need to add the discount price from PAR uh, to the credit enhancement. So here we're looking at a uh, pretty significant discount. So if you add it to the existing credit enhancement, you're looking at 50% credit enhancement versus about 14% serious delinquency. Uh, we do feel that within the credit sectors, we have put our investors in a very resilient position. Um, and should there be a recession, uh, these positions will be very well protected. Um, with that, I'm going to pass this back to Jeffrey to address some of your questions that have come in. Thank you very much and uh, happy holidays, everyone. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so per usual, I get a lot of, a lot of these questions are, are duplicates. Um, there's questions, I've never really took this question before, but someone says, I think the way it's phrased, I, it's a, led me to take it, not to be a distraction from the main topics of the call, but would be of interest to get your thoughts on crypto coins, the crypto market, if you can spare 30 seconds. It's really interesting, you know, the crypto market took off back in like 2016, 2017, and suddenly it was all crypto all the time, Bitcoin crawlers on financial media 24 seven. And I remember I uh, went out and did an appearance on the show and they asked me about Bitcoin. And uh, at the time it was at 17,000. This was in, in December of 2017, it was at 17,000. And I said, you know, I, th I think it's going to go down to 5,000 or lower. And it did. And then uh, the uh, money came from the government. And the way I think about crypto, based upon the actions, the way it's traded over the past five years or so, is that it goes up when there's money spraying going on. It's the ultimate asset for speculation. I, I think that if you give uh, 20-somethings, 30-somethings, uh, thousands and thousands of dollars, there's a good shot that they might speculate with it. And it's pretty obvious that the crypto market was highly uh, dependent upon government money. And so it went up to 60, 70,000, uh, a year ago or so, and now it's just dead in the water at about 17,000. Weirdly, exactly the level that it was at when I was on TV in December of 2017. So the return for Bitcoin has been literally nothing uh, for the past five years. And I think what would make crypto goes on, on faith and on speculation. And when you have rampant speculation, you get fraud. And when you get fraud, you know, you end up with a an overnight bankruptcy, an instantaneous implosion. And that obviously happened with FTX. And they say there's no fraud there, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but my other comment is there's never one cockroach. Um, no, one thing f scammers do is they get envious of other scammers making money. And so they imitate their scams. 
So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I do notice that we get these types of events very often in frothy markets that are overvalued and uh, just highly propped up on speculation. So I've never owned Bitcoin. I've never owned or shorted any uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, it's amazing how the narrative has switched from it's the new, new thing forever to uh, I think somebody called him Pet Rocks uh, the other day. So Pet Rock was around when I was a kid. People actually bought rocks and gave them away en masse as Christmas presents. It was a, 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 a Pet Rock. It was a rock in a box. And it, it would come with a name like, like Stanley or something. All right. Another question on the REITs, the mortgage REITs like an Agency and Annaly. Yeah, I mean, they certainly got cheap. They were trading at you know pretty big discounts, their book values. Uh, they're always challenged when the yield curve is inverted. Uh, and it, the yield curve is really inverted now. Twos, tens is uh, inverted by about 83 basis points. Uh, the highest point on the curve is the one-year bill. That's because that's there was a question on that too. That's because people think the Fed's going to tighten and then ease. And so that creates a mathematics that you get the, the highest yield on, on the one year. Um, but the mortgage REITs will be in good shape once interest rates peak and the Fed stops tightening. So there could be a buy point there, uh, and it's a pretty attractive place, but the earning power uh, suffers during this type of a cycle. Uh, somebody says 2022 has been one of the worst years for bonds. No, it's been the worst year for bonds on a calendar year basis of all time. Uh, the, the aggregate index down about, I don't know, 14, 15%. Thankfully, we're down less than that, but that's typical that we uh, risk protect better and outperform during risky periods. Uh, but uh, it's never been down even five before. So it's it's by far and away the worst bond year ever. The, the aggregate bond index down more than the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and, and not by just a percent or two. Uh, and finally, someone says, is it time to extend duration? Well, it was time to extend duration when tenure was about four and a quarter. And I'm happy to say that we did that. Those of you that follow these webcasts know that we've never been at a duration of 5.96 before in the history of double line. Uh, a, the market's gotten longer. You know, the ag index is at 6.3 or so. But the gap that we're running was as much as four years uh, uh, earlier, uh, say 18 months ago. And we're now up at about 5.96 with a gap of 0.3 years. That isn't out of uh, you know randomness. That's out of analysis of, of the economy, analysis of relative value, and where where we think uh, we have the best position of the fund. And thankfully, uh, we've uh, executed a lot of this. It yields substantially, or at least significantly, higher than where we are today. So, one last question I'll take: How are emerging markets looking? Emerging market looks pretty looks pretty good. You want that the dollar. To, it, once you get convinced, as I nearly am, I'm quite close to being truly convinced that the dollar has peaked out. Once it does, emerging markets are the place to be. Um, and so you'll get, you, you, you ought to even own them in local currency because you probably win on price and you might win on uh, the currency translation. So that does it for the webcast for 2022. Uh, we're looking forward to 2023. I think it's going to be a much better year for financial assets than 2022 because we're starting from a much better starting point and what would make it what would make uh, what, what could be better than the buffalo bills entering 2023 hopefully still as the number one seed uh for the super bowl in, in the, or in the playoffs for the afc that just happened this weekend and uh we'll be looking forward to uh, cheering on hopefully a healthy bills team speaking of health i wish everybody a healthy holiday season very much success in 2023. Thank you for your support of Double Line and goodbye for now.